Hello everybody, um, this is Owen Turner from United by Design for York Design Week and the Sunday sessions with Bright Young Things. Um, we are speaking to Joe Gilmore from Cubic. Um, Joe's a graphic designer um, and uh, lecturer for um, Leeds Uni University of Leeds. And Joe's kindly uh, agreed to talk to us um, about his practice um, and uh, yeah, I just want to say hello to Joe and uh, welcome you today, Joe. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Alan. Good. So um, this is one of our pre-records. Um, so yeah, Joe is going to give us uh, about an hour uh, or so to um, talk through his presentation and uh, then we'll have a Q&A. So we're now on record, Joe, so please um, crack on. Okay, thanks, Aaron. Um, yeah, so... I'm going to talk a little bit about my design practice, but I'm going to focus on other work that I do kind of outside of my commercial design practice. So work that is informed by sort of more of an experimental um, artistic practice, if you like, that kind of um, crosses over with design. Um, so I'll start off just showing um, if this works, oh, there we go. Um, just a bit of my design work. So I work mainly in the cultural sector. Um, so I design things like record covers, um, like this one for record label in Leeds. 12-inch um, record for a label in San Francisco. Um, website for an arts organisation that promotes music in Bristol. Um, so this is just to give a bit of a flavour a lot of gallery work, a lot of design for exhibitions, um, for artists, um, this is for the Tetley in Leeds. Um, I love typography, I love printing, um, and I love books. And I guess most of this talk is going to be about the kind of other work I do with books. Um, so I love papers, I like to kind of get involved with um, not just the design, but also sort of how things look and feel once you've got them in your hand. Um, art book for Talbot Auerbach, American artist. Um, yeah, so I did most of the work I do nowadays is, is art related. It's just the way it's kind of worked out over the years. I've always had an interest in art and I've always practiced art in some sense. Um, and so I, I understand contemporary art and I think that's helped gain clients and, and as work has just snowballed and I, I've just ended up doing lots of art books, which is something I really love. Um, so yeah, here's just some examples of those. Different galleries, some of them in the UK, some abroad. Uh, you might hear my daughter crying in the background. <laughs> that's no problem, don't worry. Um, yeah, so books are about paintings, exhibitions. This one's from Los Angeles. You know, and although the art book is sort of fairly limited in its scope in some ways, I just love the fact that you can, you can work within those kind of constraints and just create like uh, books based on ideas, play with printing, play with layout, work with like great photographers. And, you know, I just love art books. So I just, you know, nothing makes me happier than having a new art book, basically. So getting to design them is, is really great. Um, so this is the last one I was gonna show you. And this one I think is maybe quite important because it kind of shows um, kind of my interest in design and, and books. Because for this, this exhibition took place in Los Angeles in 2010. And it was a group show uh, curated by Mary Manning, who's an artist in America. And she asked all of the artists involved in the exhibition to submit some found images from the internet. And the book was just these found images kind of laid out in sort of an interesting way with no other explanation really. And when it came to the cover, it was kind of this problem which you always have with um, group exhibitions of whose work do we put on the cover? You know, we don't want to, uh, you know, foreground one person over another and there were just all these images. And I just had this idea to put all of the images on the recto uh, pages, um, all on the cover exactly where they are on their pages. And then on the back cover, 
these are all of the pictures that are on the left-hand pages, superimposed where they are on the pages over the top of each other. And I like that kind of the way that you can use design as a way of kind of thinking through a problem or a way of kind of visualizing something unusual. Um, yeah, so that, that book was quite key for me because it was sort of, you know, I like the effect and I like this kind of approach. So I guess around, I don't know, shortly around after that, around 2015, I became interested in the artist book, this idea that you could use a book um, as a kind of vehicle to kind of explore usually some sort of artistic idea, but also, you know, I think we're quite con it's, we're quite used to now as graphic designers, you know, going to places like Village Books in Leeds and picking up zines and, and things by illustrators and, you know, experimental books by photographers and all that kind of thing. So there's this wonderful overlap, I think, between, you know, like what essentially is an art practice or a self-promotion practice and graphic design. And I felt like this would be a really nice area for me to um, kind of get more involved in because it's a way of, I think that kind of practice where you're doing your own work that's not client led um, can lead you to doing projects or trying out ideas um, that you wouldn't otherwise have done. So these are by Dieter Roth or Roth, um, who's a, um, I believe he's Swiss. Um, artist. Um, so he he photocopies the Daily Mirror, uh, really sort of high resolution, and makes these books out of that. And this is an, it's a book that's inspired by Dieter Roth by another artist called Kristen Muller, where he finds magazines at flea markets in Berlin and cuts holes, die cuts holes in the pages, and then rebinds all these pages together to form these kind of wonderful um books and what i like about these and apparent and particularly Dieter roth's work is this approach to the book as as a kind of purely experimental playground to try out all sorts of ideas and essentially question what a book is you know and i think a lot of what i do with these projects which i'll show you now they're kind of like this kind of investigation into what a book is or how a book works or how it might work if we did it differently. Um, so they're all, yeah, kind of within that realm of book arts. Um, so this is the first one I did. Um, so this is from 2010 and it's published by Catalogue Library, um, who are based in Leeds, publish books and zines and magazines and stuff like that. And this is a two color risograph print book. Um, it's between A5 and A4. And the idea I had with this book was that normally a page in a book is kind of a distinct uh, kind of fixed area on which the content sits in the middle usually. Um, and I kind of had this idea that what if you could suggest that there was another way of reading a book? You know, if you read a novel that, um, I forget what they're called, but it has like branching stories, you could imagine being sent to a different page in a book, you know, go to page 52 now or 23 or something. So this book, I kind of just had this idea that the edges of the paper could be kind of like connected to other surfaces in the book. So I found, I use these found images online and the images themselves um, aren't particularly that important. I mean, I, cur I curated them and chose them, but what I was more interested in with this book is the kind of the layout game, which is kind of like a system. So for example, um, the top half of this picture down here, can you see my mouse there? Oh, yeah. Uh, the top half of this book here um, is there and the bottom half of, of the same image is up there. So there's a relationship between the bottom of this page and this one. And the other half of this image with these BAs is actually on the next spread on the, the other page. And the other half of this image, you can see is on the previous spread there. Yeah. So you've got this kind of, I don't know, this kind of really sort of interesting, non-linear way of perhaps dealing with book 
with the book structure and the book content. And I felt like, I don't know, I feel like this was quite an interesting <laughs> kind of pointless idea, but um, it kind of, kind of, I don't know, it kind of interests me that you can think of a book as two layers. It's kind of physical structure defined by the pages and how big they are and all that kind of stuff. And then also the content of the book, which can suggest kind of um, other ways of reading the book. So I feel like this, I don't know, kind of reflects back on graphic design and book design in a sort of, I think, quite an interesting way. And with this, Joe, um, were you thinking around the materials? You mentioned paper and obviously, you know, it's important as part of the book design as a whole. Are you thinking about the paper as you're designing or are you thinking about the paper and, and how it's going to come together um, in the physical form at the end? I mean, with this one, um, I can't remember. I think this is printed on a paper called Monka and I can't remember. I mean, it was largely what the risograph printer printed best on. And I think I discussed it with the catalogue guys. And I, I guess I chose the paper for the cover as well. I mean, I love Munken and the paper for the cover is a Fedragoni stock and we screen printed this title on it. Um, so yeah, I do think about the, the paper stocks. Maybe some books, not always beforehand. Sometimes it's a little bit like the, um, the production process after. Yeah. Um, and then a sort of a friend of mine in Amsterdam started a project around 2016, I think, called the Kippenberger Challenge. And the website is, is 7.45books.eu. And he, he kind of read somewhere that the artist, Martin Kippenberger, um, who produced loads of artist books, apparently somebody worked out that his average annual output was 7.45 books. Um, you know, that's his uh, annual average. And so he called this project 7.45 books. And it's really a challenge for creatives to try and produce, to try and equal that amount of books in a year. So the idea is you go onto the website, you sign up, uh, and it rec records your date as your starting point. And you basically have a year to make 7.45 books. And so I decided to sign up for this because I kind of thought, well, that's a good way of having a deadline and a, you know, a commitment is a good way of making you do some stuff. Um, so I thought this would be a good way of kind of making me produce some more books. Um, so I signed up and then I produced a whole range of other books throughout that year. And I equaled the challenge. I didn't want to fail. I had to like, um, you know, there was no way I could fail. I had to do it. So this is another book where, I mean, it's similar to the first one, the first one called Void, a Fedragoni stock for the cover again. This is another set of images, found images again, you, um, which I kind of printed. Um, it's almost like I took the images, printed half on one page and half on another random page in pink, and then shuffled the images and printed, printed overprinted half in red and half in red on another page. So it's almost like shuffling the images and splitting them in half throughout the book. So the other half of this pink image um, is elsewhere at the second half of the book. And I was quite interested again in this idea that, you know, again, thinking of non-linear ways of reading or looking at books, but also the way that a book like this is just a, a, a set of folded sheets of paper and that one page is actually connected to, you know, page two is connected to page 18 physically, but is divorced from it and separated from it through the binding. So a lot of these images, you know, the other half of this pink image, I think is on page 18 or something like that. Um, but it just creates these beautiful sort of layered um, compositions, these kind of almost chance encounters between pairs of images. Um, the idea of shuffling a book or something like that. And I love these because I don't, you know, that I don't have to answer to anybody. I'm not making this for somebody and I don't particularly need to justify it that much. I'm quite happy that they're sort of experimental and uh, a bit fuzzy at the edges perhaps. And um, the kind of experiments in a way, you know. Um, and then moving on, 
Um, I'm really interested in James Joyce. I'm kind of a bit obsessed with the writings of James Joyce and his books, and particularly Finnegan's Wake, which is a book he wrote. He took 17 years to write. And if you look at it, here's a page from it, a random page. Um, it's kind of, uh, it's, um, it's, I think it's one of the most complex books in the, in the English language. It's just, the whole, the whole thing is like this. And that really intrigued me as to why somebody would spend 17 years writing what looks like, um, you know, gobbledygook or nonsense. Um, and so I'm kind of a bit obsessed with this book. And I also love the way that some of it is typeset. So some of the chapters are typeset like this. So it, it also ventures not only from this kind of weird language, but into sort of strange ways of uh, representing, um, you know, novels or text or fiction or a narrative. And one of the one of the key things about this book is it's circular. So the first line of the first chapter begins with a lowercase letter. Um, and the last line of the book doesn't end with a full stop, it ends mid sentence. And so you've got about 630 pages of this kind of stream of um, complex nonsense literature which when you get to the end, it goes back to the beginning. Wow. Um, so the idea is, is that you, you're supposed to never kind of finish reading this book. And I think that's really profound. That's kind of, if you think about it, that is quite crazy. Um, and it brings up lots of ideas like, well, if, if novels are normally based on the idea of time, if you have a circular novel, what happens before and after becomes kind of meaningless because actually, when you get back to the beginning, you're actually reading about events which have taken place after the events which they were supposed to proceed. So it's kind of quite maddening, this book. But it kind of interested me, that idea of a circular book. So I made another one of these kind of experiments in layout, where I kind of thought if you had 30 images, again, just found images from the internet. Um, and if you imagine that a book space, like let's say a 20 page book, if you laid all the pages out end to end, it might take up, you know, like uh, 30 foot or something, you know. So it has a kind of physical, a physical horizontal space, a book. And if you took 30 images and you just kind of fitted them into that space side by side, so if you just compress the size of each image so that it fits into the full width of the book, you get this kind of, this composition where the images wrap over the pages. So that's from the previous page. I've missed out some pages um, here. Oh, uh, there's a couple of rude pictures. Um, but the pictures just carry on next to each other, the exact size they were as I found them and dropped them into InDesign. And I've just resized them all so that when you get to the back of the book, um, I'm not sure if you can see that top image, but the last image ends here. So the idea there is this kind of strange idea that thinking about the book space again as one physical sort of structure and then its content, which in this case is 30 images, um, that you kind of make them fit and you ignore the pages, for example. You know, these images kind of, normally in books, an image kind of sits on a page or, and the page kind of defines that here the images ignore the page structure and just kind of roll on their way through the book. So again, another sort of like mildly interesting experiment with kind of this way of thinking about, and I, I've used this layout, you know, I did this and I kind of thought it was quite cool in a way to kind of unusually position all of the pictures along the top edge of the page. And it's doing things like this that I've actually used in subsequent designs. I've kind of thought, um, you know, I've done books this year where I did a book for an architect this year and I employed a similar sort of strategy because a lot of design is just a sort of, you know, it's the rules that the designer invents. It's a process, it's a system. Um, and, and the great thing about having the experience of doing design for like 20 years or so 
is that you start feeling confident about those rules. So you can just, you know, you can invent your own and as long as they're, they're tight and they, they work for the particular job, um, then, you know, it, it's really great. How do you find that on a day-to-day -day basis, Joe, going from kind of potentially some of those more commercial rigid, rigidity processes, boundaries to your more experimental stuff? And the you know opening up your practice further in in your own time is it something that you find quite easy? Well, I think with a lot of this this stuff, I just have to find time to do it. And normally, if I'm teaching at Leeds, normally when I'm travelling in, I might work on these projects on my laptop, um, just because I just sort of feel like sometimes I just have ideas and I have a text file and I just write down my ideas when I have them, and then when I get time, I do them. Um, I haven't had so much time recently. So some of these things always get put on the back burner of other things, you know. Um, but I do, you know, I do feel like this really frees me up and it does, it really does help my design practice, I think, you know. Yeah. And it kind of teaches me about design because I feel like I'm investigating outside of just, you know, doing commercial work. So here's another one, for example, where in this one, the rule is, is that the images are just positioned by their corners. And I kind of tried to think about, well, what happens when an image hits the corner of a page like this? And so in this case, I kind of had them, if it goes off the bottom, it appears at the top. And if it goes off the right, it also appears on the next page somehow. So it kind of carries on to here. And then that guy appears up here again and then carries on again. So it's kind of a bit like a spiral this one, like a helix or something. And again, it was just an idea I had on the bus, basically. Um, and then this was another project um, as part of this 7.45 books. I'm not sure how we're doing for time, by the way. It's okay, keep going, Joe, it's fine. Um, where I had some sugar paper lying around my studio and I'd left a book on on one of them and the sun had bleached the paper and left this impression of the book. And I just felt that was a really kind of almost like a poetic image because it is an image. It's almost like the, the fundamentals of printing, you know, but without using any ink or print systems, it's, it's really, it's the sun. Um, and it's, it's the impression of a book. And so I made about, I can't remember how many, about 30 or 40 of these on different colored uh, sugar paper. And they're all books about James Joyce. Um, and I kind of just bound them together as this sort of a book about the absence of other books. So it's kind of like this, this idea that, you know, we're surrounded, we're all surrounded by books. I can see loads in the background there behind you. And, um, you know, they're all there and we lose them and we pass them on. and they somehow become part of our consciousness and our learning and our culture. And so I called it the zero point of sculpture because a book is a physical object and this one has gone. And it, I don't know, it's kind of like the zero point of sculpture is having no sculpture at all or something, that kind of idea. Um, and then moving on, I might really have to rush, uh, speed up a bit. Um, actually, maybe we're doing okay. We're nearly halfway through. Um, in going back to Joyce again, um, Joyce in his book Finnegan's Wake employs these kind of typographic characters, which you can see down here, and he calls them Sigla, S I G L A, and they appear throughout the text. They sometimes appear within the text. Um, there's quite a few of them. That's just a few, and after reading this book for years, I kind of suddenly realized that these were actually really interesting as typographic letter forms or kind of typographic glyphs that the meaning of which is kind of slightly ambiguous. And I kind of thought that was really interesting that as a novelist, Joyce had kind of invented his own typography or language, not only within the English language, such as you can see above, but also right down to the alphabet these kind of hieroglyphic alphabetic sort of characters. And so I kind of decided to make a book 
um, just kind of using those really and just kind of it's really um, it, this is a a3 so it's using an a2 risograph printer from in the Netherlands um, and it's so it's quite a, quite a big book and it's just printed in two colors and it just has these uh, glyphs kind of arranged in these kind of combinations where it's almost like it's almost like a catalog for um, a font you know you can kind of download these um, fonts or sample packs or you get sometimes you get mailed them so it was almost like this kind of celebration of this font or this these glyphs or this typeface um, but it was also sort of using the green and blue I sort of sometimes overprinted them <clears throat> And, and place them next to each other in these combinations where I was trying to make sort of graphical sense of them. Um, so I made that book and then on the <clears throat> back of that, it sold out, it's only a short run, um, but Village Books and Catalogue Library asked me to do another one, um, I think for an exhibition in a Village or something. And so I decided to make another one, two colour again, but this time include quotes from Finnegan's Wake, which relate <clears throat> um, to these shapes and kind of help, um, help sort of make sense of them a little bit. So this one says, concoct an equo-angular triliter. Kind of, in other words, um, con concoct an equo equilateral triangle. Um, so Joyce plays around with with meaning and language in this in this way. Um, so here he's, he calls it an aquiliteral dry ankle. So it's kind of um, it's it's kind of going back to Euclid and this Euclid's problems of geometry about creating triangles and stuff like that. Um, and here he he sort of says it pubably resembles a pelvic of some kind. So he starts to turn them into pictures. Um, or a cone, a cone, or sort of graphic shapes. So it's really interesting how these, these glyphs are somewhere, they exist somewhere between letter form, alphabetic letter form, image, like hieroglyph, where he says it looks like a pelvis. Um, so like image and text and language and, you know, typography and image. So I think they're really interesting and they're kind of, you know, these books just come out of that. Um, interest in sort of Joyce typography and and letter forms and language, if you like. Is this still available to to purchase, Joe? Are you? Is it something mm -hmm. that you know is is still available? Um, no, I think I don't know. Village might have some left, but I don't think so. I think maybe we did like seventy five copies or a hundred copies or something. And they're hand sewn, you can see the thread sewn. They're really beautifully made, like uh, catalogue printed and bound them really, you know, I love the stuff they do, really good attention to detail. Yeah. So it was a lovely little handmade book, you know, with a really nice paper too. I can't remember what the paper is, but it's, it's probably not quite as translucent as it appears here. I think that's come out in the scanner. It's almost, Bible, it almost looks like Bible paper, that kind of... Yeah, it is a little bit thicker than that. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, maybe we should do another edition of that. And then this 7.45 books thing, because the because it's called 7.45 books, which is quite funny if you think about it, some people have tried to do 0.5 of a book. <laughs> and if you can look at everybody's work on the website. Um, and I just felt like, okay, yeah, it's gonna be quite fun making 0.45 of a book. And so, kind of use the same principle as some of those earlier ones where it's just some found images of sculptures from the British Library. Um, and I've, I've laid them out sort of in a similar way across the book. And then I overprinted, so I printed all of the, the book out. I only made a handful of copies of this. Printed out the book just on a digital copier with just the sculptures and then printed 55% black ink over the top of, so I put the papers back, the pages back through the printer and I overprinted the black ink so you can kind of see the pictures through. So it was this idea of 
only you know 0.45 of the book is visible um yeah so you know quite a simple idea and i liked how the reason i chose historical images from the from the british library was this idea that history is is kind of like this we're left with these relics and we really don't know you know half the story or maybe even more in, in a lot of cases and we're just you know history is kind of a construct and we're kind of in the dark it's kind of that idea so that's why i chose those images that's the back cover and then um I decided to do the, the challenge again because you can do it every year if you want to. You can just sign up to do another one. And I felt that was quite fruitful. I kind of really enjoyed it. It kind of got me to do more stuff outside of my own practice. So I just signed up for another one. And then these are some of those books. I'll try and go through these a bit quicker. This was a workshop I ran at Leeds University with students to make some collages like an illustration workshop, workshop using collage. And after the students have left, had left, I was clearing up the studio and I picked up a couple of magazines and they, they looked exactly like this, where the pages have been ripped and torn and cut. And I actually felt like there's, there's a found beauty in that. Like, I love that, um, that composition. I mean, I couldn't have done something better had I purposefully tried. And I, I just became fascinated by these magazines. They're just being chopped, cut up over a couple of years because I've got a box of magazines that they use. And just the kind of interplay between the pages, you know, it's just, I think, really interesting. So I just scanned it. Or I scanned some pages like this one particularly. You know, it's just, just magical, I think, how these arms with the sculpture and these kind of different pages are all intersecting in this kind of interesting way. You're so, right, you're so right about that kind of accidental precision <laughs> in terms yeah. of being able to put, you know, both at university, you know, I, I remember being tasked on similar kind of collage projects, but, you know, you're so right as that kind of commercial art of and design, you probably couldn't nail it as well as, as this page. Yeah, and this, like, I'm sure most designers have had the experience of... Um, you know, a happy accident, something, you know, you cut and paste. I do this all the time where I, I paste something from one page of InDesign into another and it, it appears not where I expected it to. And it suddenly just looks really amazing wherever it's landed and you kind of, you can exploit that. But, I, you know, I love this. I've done a couple of these where I just, you know, they're kind of raw and messy, but I don't know, there's, I just think there's a beauty in them as well that I really love. Um, and then another book, another person who I became really interested in is this artist, Ulysses Carrion, who's a Mexican artist who a lot of designers might have heard of. If you go to book fairs these days, Ulysses Carrion quite often is mentioned there or there's books of his uh, there. And he so he opened the first artist bookshop in Amsterdam in the 1970s, which was solely um, just artist books. And he had exhibitions there and it was kind of a new, newly emerging sort of genre. And um, he made his own books and his particular interest, he studied actually English at Leeds University, which I didn't find out till a couple of years ago. So it's a weird thing about this, this obscure Mexican artist who found himself in Europe studying in English at Leeds University and then goes on to be this kind of major person in the artist book and the world of artist books. And his big thing was this idea of rethinking what a book is and what language is. So he did all these things like deconstructing poetry and text. So he wrote these kind of concrete poems that are just based on rhythm. And I think sometimes he would take other texts and analyze their structure and make kind of new books based on those. And I, I don't know, I thought that was really interesting how you could look at another text and derive something from it. So this book I made 
again, going back to Finnegan's Wake, another, you know, uh, reference to that book. Um, one of, there's, there's like hundreds of characters in Finnegan's Wake and one of them is from all over history and literature, there's just teeming with characters. Um, and one of them is Humpty Dumpty that appears about 30 or 40 times throughout the text. And there's a, a book by a woman called Adeline Glasheen where she, she makes like a telephone directory of all of the names in Finnegan's Wake. And I think what's interesting about that book is the only reason it exists is because of Finnegan's Wake. It's, it's just this completely useless book. It's only a directory, an index of the names in Finnegan's Wake. And I love that idea that some books only exist because of other books. Um, so part of my interest in this was, okay, so if you took Finnegan's Wake and you look at her book to determine which pages Humpty Dumpty appears, um, and then just photocopy those pages left and right, so right-hand pages, you can see here somewhere there's Humpty Dumpty, I can't remember where it is, in this one. oh, there, Humpty Dumpty's here, and here, um, Humpty Hillhead, Tumpty Tom Toes. And if it's on a left-hand page, I photocopied it on the left. So I just photocopied my copy of Finnegan's Wake and made this book. Um, and in a way, it's, it's a portrait of another book, which I felt was quite interesting, you know, to make a book which somehow is just an insight into another book. It just reveals something of the amount of times. It's, it's ridiculous in a way, like Humpty Dumpty. I picked the most ridiculous character. Um, that I could think of, and but it, it it shows something about the structure of that massive book of literature because I've indicated how many left-hand pages or how often it appears or the frequency of its appearance. So it's kind of like a a structural study of a piece of literature or something like that. Um, and then I think we're quite quite near the end last couple of projects I think. Um, so I wrote a book arts module at Leeds University uh, for my students for them to do projects like this for graphic designers well and people from art and design as well and um, this project was kind of I was putting together the module and I was photocopying lots of lots of interesting stuff about book arts and artists books for my kind of research and I use having free access to a photocopier and I love photocopies. I love the kind of this kind of aesthetic, you know, of the, the greys and the, the mistakes and all of that kind of stuff. You know, I think it's wonderful. Um, and I, I just kind of realized that you could with these photocopies I was making that you could just put them back through the printer and start building up these kind of overprinted sort of, I don't know, images or collections of data or collections of research. And I just love how all of these, all of this knowledge around one subject can all start to collide in this completely free way. So I hardly even planned these. I just had access to this photocopier. And quite often I would just print things and enlarge them and keep them in a box in my studio. And then sometimes I'll go back to the photocopier, put them back in the tray and photocopy new stuff over the top. And it just became this kind of, you know, really free playing sort of process of layering, printing, exploring printing, exploring overprinting, you know, just, just seeing what happened. And like I say, most of them are just not planned at all. They're kind of, they're accidents or just, you know, I was really not very precious about them. And then I've, I've bound some of them together into these kind of booklets, um, which are kind of a kind of series of um, books. So this is just one of them. So these are, this is Dieter Roth performances in the middle. <clears throat> and then Lee, this is another book from NASA. These are just named after the letters of the Greek alphabet. And so the next one's called Beta, and I might just carry on. And for this one, I kind of realized that 
I can't, I remember realizing this in the middle of the night. I remember waking up and just thinking, oh, actually, it would be quite cool because if you use a photocopier to print, and if you're overprinting, you could use bits of white paper to mask out while you're copying as an extra sort of layer of the process. So I went back to one of those found magazines from my workshops and I just cut out some sort of bits of white paper and I used the photocopier to kind of uh, just photocopy random pages from this fashion magazine and overlay bits of white paper and then do the same process again. And you get these like really amazing overlaid shapes where the white paper is creating a sort of negative shape and the overprinting is just all sort of coinciding in these kind of semi-chaotic, but I, th I think quite beautiful ways. So again, it's kind of thinking about, I don't know, just process, you know, using a process, exploring photocopier as a tool, exploring, you know, printing or masking as a sort of way of thinking about design. Uh, so that's those. And then I tried the same thing with a comic, with the Beano. I think this is the Beano. It's either the Beano or Dandy. Um, kind of maybe less successful. But, um, you know, I don't know. I think Dieter Roth does a lot of things with comics, which was the inspiration here. Um, you still pick up some of the narrative, though, don't you? In terms of those layers, you kind of start to create a new story or a new yeah um cartoon that runs a different different journey which is, is yeah yeah i think i mean i don't think this one was really particularly that finished i think um i don't know like it would be interesting to explore zooming in on this a bit more sort of you know how these lines and details if they start to get really big would start to create some really beautiful but it's just one of those things i haven't got around to doing <laughs> but it's quite funny to use sort of such a lowbrow kind of um, source material in a comics. I think Dieter Roth is great for that because he's, I mean, he used kind of excrement in his work, you know, like rabbit poo, and he made he made books with sausages and stuff like that, like packing book paper with sausage meat, just kind of really, I don't know, uh, kind of like an anti-art kind of thing. Um, I was, there was a couple more projects actually. This was just another void book where I, I kind of took photographs of books on sculpture in the Henry Moore Art Gallery Library. And I kind of guess this one, this is just a one color risograph. And I just kind of felt like it's interesting that books are three dimensional objects. I think we kind of forget that and how the page and the bending of the page and the coinciding of things within a book in a sort of sculptural way. I don't know, I was kind of just interested in that. So I just took some pictures of books on sculpture and was interested in, I don't know, I guess the kind of different representation of a, a book as a sculptural object and the books are about sculptures. Perhaps not so um, interesting as the others, but I have some of those here on my desk found the other day for sale. <laughs> so if anyone wants one, drop me an email. Um, and then I think maybe this is the last section thing. What time are we on? Um, this was, this came out of um, having a whole bunch of Moose magazine, which is an art magazine from Italy in my studio. And I needed to clear some space. So I kind of thought well, I should probably just get rid of this big pile of magazines. Um, I really like Moose magazine. It's an art magazine, but it's really well designed by a friend of mine in Italy. And um, I really love the ads in it. It's one of those magazines, if you ever pick up Freeze, for example, the magazine, just from a graphic design perspective, the, the ads for all the galleries, there's loads of them in there. There's like about half the magazine is ads. The ads are just amazing. The typography and the design, you know, they're worth getting just for that. And I was the same with Moose magazine, it's full page ads are just, they're lovely. And before I threw these out, I kind of felt like I really like these for the ads. Um, so I thought, well, I'll just tear the ads out. You know, I'll just, I'll just keep them in a box and just keep some of the ads because I like them. And then I sort of realized, I kind of had them sat around and I, 
I folded a couple of them and made them into these little zines. So I just got like eight of these um, ads, folded them in half and stapled them together with a kind of overprinted, this is a title which I printed and a number. And I kind of, I just felt like these were really funny in a way because that whole idea again of folding a sheet of paper in a book and it somehow, the, it then becoming divorced from its other half um, is kind of exploited in these because here you've got half of a gallery ad clashing with the half of another gallery ad in this quite an interesting way. And it kind of creates these funny, almost like hybrid exhibitions. You know, some of them are better than others. Like I love that one. I mean, you know, that could be uh, a design poster just in itself. Um, and they look, they look really nice if you sort of hold the books up this way. Um, so these again are just a kind of, I don't know, they're kind of a bit of a playful uh, project. I've got a box of them now where I just, I make one, I, I put, the, I put the cover through the printer and just print this title and the number of each one in the top. Um, yeah, I mean, you can see the designs are great, just these lovely typography. And, uh, I love number five, that's great. Yeah, isn't that great? <laughs> like that combination of those two, that Sarah Lucas sculpture going into this kind of floral painting or something. And again, that, you know, this ladder leading into this type. Um, and that as well, this kind of rainbow. So, you know, I like the kind of fortuitous chance encounter, if you like. The kind of, I don't know, the, the ridiculousness of it in a way. But also, I don't know, kind of, for me, I'm, I'm just fascinated by books and like, I think a lot of these projects just help me just really rethink what a book is, you know, or like, you know, like perhaps I'll use this in an art book project where you can sort of deal with sections of the book and how sort of the content, you know, appears on its, the other, the other side of the section, you know, that would be a really cool commercial book. I mean, people, would, some people would hate it, but, um, oh yeah, this is the last one. Um, so this was just, a, I, mean, I guess this is a work in progress where I kind of, with a lot of the similar ideas from before, um, I love finding images and I, I keep a blog called Void, which is the same title as those other books. And all of the images are just from there. It's kind of like a Tumblr and I use it for kind of visual research, I guess, into art and design. So if you go to my website, it's not really linked anywhere. You go forward slash ZR. Um, and so I always use the images from that, which is probably a bit naughty, but I mean, they're not really big commercial projects. These they're just, you know, small art editions or something. So I've, I've been making these, these kind of um, small zines. It's kind of about a four ish kind of size, a bit smaller. And I, I take a bunch of found images and lay them out and design a sort of 16 page zine just with the images. And then I design another one and I've designed about eight or nine of these. And then I overprint them. So I take book one and print it over book two or take book three and overprint it over book one or print book four upside down over book one. And it just becomes this endless game where with the same content, and the same images, which are playing all sorts of various games in terms of appearing off the page and on other pages and all that kind of stuff, which we've seen before. It just becomes this kind of, again, this layered chance encounter of ways that we might read images together, you know, so this coincidence of like arms and hands and sculptures and graphic forms and and forms within the pictures. You know, I just love the way that things start to kind of make their own kind of sense in a way or something. And they're also, I mean, I don't know, I think they're quite beautiful. Um, and then that's led me on to, I haven't finished this project yet, but it led me into starting to fold the pages. So these, 
these pages have just been folded at kind of 45 degrees. And then the front page over here, you can see it's been folded there and this page has been folded over. And again, that starts to create another layer of kind of uh, juxtaposition where this image is supposed to actually be vertical, but it's been folded up and is now coinciding with, with these images. Um, again, you know, I think as a sketch, this is kind of fairly maddening and unusual and weird, but um, I'd, I'd love to do this in a book. You know, I'd love to have the opportunity to start thinking about folding pages and start thinking about how the content of one page when it's folded affects the content of another page. That could be really interesting, I think. So yeah, I think that's the last slide. I think, I don't know, I mean, hopefully, I guess the whole gist of that talk is really, you know, about how that practice is kind of used as a way of investigating design and a way of um, experimenting, investigating design as a practitioner, as a practice, as a process, and hopefully sort of, I don't know, revealing some of those rules, some of those systems that we all love as designers, that, that you know, a book is a system of rules. A book is a kind of system of decisions. Uh, and I just, I love that. I love kind of trying to get under the hood of that and trying to kind of work out what that's all about or what you can do with it. You know, like a system, you know, could be anything, you know, like people like John Cage or, you know, the composer from the 60s and 70s, you know, used dice to compose music. And I love the arts for that because there is this whole, you know, uh, focus on process, you know, how something is made is often quite important. And I think, that, I don't know, I think maybe I'm trying to do something like that, I'm not sure. So, yeah. Joe, I yeah, this, I, I mean, I, I could listen to you for a lot, lot longer. Um, it's been really wonderful to, to get a glimpse of some of the work that you've been doing, obviously, um, historically, but also, you know, continuing that practice um, still. Um, it's wonderful to see that both how your work commercially informs your, I suppose, other projects and how your projects that you're doing in, in your spare time inform obviously your, your commercial work. So I think it just goes to show that it's an evolving process and, you know, truly enjoyable. The, some of the things that you've shown have, have really got me excited and, you know, I'd love to be able to see some of these actually. Um, so I'm definitely going to be checking out more. Um, yeah, as, yeah. as Joe's just put up there on 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 screen, um, I definitely recommend going and having a look at uh, Joe's work. Um, there's some incredible projects on his website. Um, but Joe, I really yeah would like to say thank you for for giving us all a treat um, in, into your work. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure. Um, just to wrap things up, we've we've asked every single person who's spoken uh, on the Sunday sessions to. Um, answer a few quick questions. Um, I hope you don't mind just giving us a little bit more time. No. Um, I have given you a little bit of a, an insight with these with these questions, so you might have thought no. about them already. But some of them, uh, some of them, I'm not sure how to answer actually. Yeah, but, no, yeah. it's not a problem. It's not uh, to put you on the spot, but it would no, be no, good right. to get your your thoughts on it. So we've got the themes running through this year's Design Week, and um, to start with we're going to uh, go with activist. Do you see yourself as an activist? If so, what is the one thing that you would like to change? I mean, yeah, I mean, when I, when I saw that question, I was like, I don't really think of myself as an activist. I mean, I've got quite strong political views and there's lots about the world I hate at the moment. You know, the, just the, the what do you call it? Popularist, you know, rhetoric, which is just everywhere. It's just, you know, it's so sad to, to, to see and to, and the environment and ecology and all that kind of stuff is just really worrying. So all of that stuff worries me. And of course, I care a lot about, um, you know, I, I'm not really an activist in that sense. I, I try to do my little bit, I guess. Um, 
probably more of a cultural activist, maybe, you know, with my little corner of, you know, maybe an activist within graphic design or uh, books or something. But yeah, but I, I, I do feel strongly about lots of stuff. Yeah, I think that's a good answer. I think um, a lot of us are like that, probably. Um, and it's a big, it's a big question, isn't it? It's one of those yeah. things that where do you start and where do you end? Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's good. Um, play, uh, play is shown to release endorphins, improve brain, brain functionality, and stimulate creativity. But there is often a misconception that play is only for children as part of growing up. But how do you play? Um, probably a bit sad. I kind of <laughs> made projects like the ones you've just seen. Like I don't know. I, I one of my favourite things is graphic design. You know, I couldn't be more happy doing something that I really love. And luckily I, I'm in a position where I design things I like, you know, like art books. I guess if I was designing things I didn't like, I wouldn't be so happy, but I guess I do other things too. I make music. So I do other sort of art related things, creative things. Um, I've got a daughter, so I play with her or do things with her. I draw, I like drawing. Um, these are all sort of creative things, aren't they? But I like, I grew up studying illustration and uh, we were taught how to draw at Cambridge College of Arts and Technology. And I've always had this interest and joy of just, I don't really show much of it, but I just, I like drawing people and landscapes and stuff just in a sketchbook. So I've quite often got a sketchbook with me. I enjoy that. Great stuff. Um, rewild. Um, how do you like to rewild and reconnect with nature and the green space around you? Probably the obvious things like go for walks in the park. Uh, the Roundtree Parks in York is not far from here. Um, got an allotment, we've just got an allotment, so that's a bit of green space. Which Get your hands dirty. <laughs> yeah, we'll probably fail miserably at that, you know. Uh, but yeah, allotment, just getting out for walks and stuff like that, I think. You know, I yeah. love going out into the country. Um, I love camping. Um, it's so good if you go camping for an extended period of time, you know, like three or four days, and you just start to really merge with the landscape a bit and sort of slow down and sort of find a different rhythm. I love that. Yeah, it, absolutely. You almost have, well, you're forced to do that, aren't you, with camping? You yeah. have to slow down. Yeah. Um, no, good answer. Um, space, we don't see space as a physical place. People make spaces. What spaces have you created this year and what space have you found makes you happiest? That was a hard one. Because <laughs> like I think since, you know, COVID space, I mean, physical space is, you know, it's weird because physical space is suddenly just home or, you know, and our house is quite small and yeah, physical space is a problem. Uh, other spaces I mean I don't know I spend a lot of my time working online and I guess I've got digital spaces and friends and sort of things that are going on where I've got collaborations online with music and with just friends I guess like those kind of commu online communities so I don't know I don't know if that answers the question but something like that. No I think it does I think um, absolutely we we kind of rely on technology but also it, people forget that it is a space that you can do great things in and, and you know, collaborate and, and extend friendships, all sorts of things. So yeah, it's, it's very yeah. valid. I never used to like Twitter very much. I found it a bit of a kind of I don't know, a shouting gallery and it's really, you know, opinionated and, and I didn't really like that. I like Instagram just because it's, it's quite subtle. It's just the kind of, if you're into imagery, imagery, I, I like that, but I guess I've got a little bit more into Twitter. It's nice to just sort of, hear from people and see what people are doing i like that kind of community yeah it's great yeah thank you um trust what do you trust in um friends i think you know i think with everything like i said everything's going on in the world that's so depressing you can trust and rely on your family and friends i think hopefully i mean i can and like it's just good to know that there are good people out there still doing good things who still care and haven't got 
horrible opinions on things or you know hurtful views on you know the way things are yeah so i mean trust in other people and friendships i think for yeah. me is a big thing lovely you know, I've got lots of friends in america who i don't some of whom i've never met and some who i just know online and i only see once every five years but just staying in touch online is just i don't know it's just so nice having that kind of um closeness in a way that's not really close but it's something yeah yeah net network is important isn't it and and having that being able to tap into certain people at the right time for yeah. you uh, and like you say that trust and ability and making sure that you know that those people are there for you it's um, yeah. it is important yeah and then finally um share october the 10th was mental health awareness day and we've seen a lot of campaigns around keeping the conversation going this year this year has been very isolating for many people. Have you had to learn new ways of sharing and opening up? Yeah, that was a hard one. I don't know. I mean, I guess like being at home and being sort of in lockdown and stuff obviously has its pressures that puts you under because you're in the same house with the same people 24 seven. So yeah, I guess there are sort of some things you've had to learn about your own, you know, annoying habits, I guess. To, might be you know like my taste in music for example is not to everyone's taste in music so yeah you kind of realize that space becomes more of a shared thing and the way we are becomes more of a shared experience so you possibly i mean it's hard to put my finger on any examples but yeah i think it definitely has an impact yeah well, I must say, Joe, it's been great that you've been sharing your time with us today. Um, thank you so much. It's been really great to, to understand a little bit more about you and your practice and your work. Um, it's inspired me and I'm definitely going to be checking out uh, the 7.45 books. Um, you've inspired yeah. me there. And um, it. Yes. Up. yeah, well, <laughs> we'll try and fit it in next year. Yeah. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. We hope to catch up with you again very soon. Cool, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.